After 2023, it seems like the UFC is in a whole new place. There's a bunch of new champions, but not every division is running smoothly. Even now, there's several that seem to have just kind of stalled. But being such an unpredictable sport, this is of course not the first time it's happened. Some of you might know about the career of Dominic Cruz and how long he was considered champion for whilst not fighting because of an injury. But the UFC did a great job of keeping the division moving, crowning an interim champion who could actually defend his belt in Hen and Barrow. But that has not always been the case, and at times, things have really slowed down. I'm Bailey in from Around Point. Cheers to all you Channel Hall of Famers for helping us bring you the video today. And these are 10 times UFC divisions completely stalled. Number 10, the Grasso Valentina Trilogy. Well, why don't we start with an ongoing stalled division at women's flyweight, starting in 2018 and after a long reign of 1,547 days and seven defenses, Valentina Shevchenko was finally beaten and for the first time ever, the division had a new champion. Alexa Grasso, unless you count Nico Montagne, which is fine, I guess. It was a crazy upset that shook up the whole MMA sphere, so of course the UFC wanted to run it back, and that wasn't necessarily a bad idea. The only problem was the rematch went to a draw. Well, I'm happy with my performance. You know, I think for me it was 3-2. The second, fourth, and fifth were for me, but I'm not the judge, so... Actually, yes, I was very sure that it was three rounds my side, two rounds Grasso's side. Alexa got to keep the title, and despite some fans probably okay with moving on to something else, Dana was at to book the trilogy fight. You have to do the rematch. We will rematch them. It's it's the right thing to do. It's the it's the fight that needs to happen. It makes sense, as you know, Valentina was very competitive in that fight, and it was Mike Bell who gave the fifth round 10-8 to Grasso, which swung the result. But it does mean that for another six months, all the contenders had to wait in line once more. But the real stall came when Valentina announced she needed surgery. Top contenders like Aaron Blanchfield, Manon Ferro, or Macy Barber are all gonna have to wait or, well, yeah, start fighting each other, I guess. Number 9, the Anthony Pettis era. The final lightweight championship fight in the WEC saw Anthony Pettis win the title over Benson Henderson and then arrive in the UFC ready to fight the lightweight champion. In January 2011, that was Frankie Edgar and he fought Gray Maynard, but famously the fight ended in a draw. So that kind of stalled the unification of the two MMA world titles the UFC booked to rematch, but instead of waiting, Pettis took a fight against Clay Guida and, well, he lost. By unanimous decision, Clay Guida! In the meantime, the guy Anthony beat in the WEC, Benson Henderson, came in, beat Frankie Edgar, and became the new UFC champion. He made three defenses before Anthony Pettis got his shot at him as he'd been dealing with several injuries. I tried to even fight Aldo at 145. I went to Vegas to uh, get the knee checked out to see if I could make a fight with Jose Aldo. Dana and Fertitas thought it would be a bad idea to put me in there and not have a replacement that fast for, you know, Jose Aldo fight. And it wasn't until August 2013 where he finally got to fight for a UFC title, nearly two and a half years after he was supposed to originally fight for the belt. Showtime beat Benson again, and more impressively this time, and it seemed like the division was right where it was supposed to be, but things started to stall again pretty much immediately. Pettis was supposed to defend his title against TJ Grant, but that got cancelled, and it was switched to Josh Thompson, but again, Anthony got injured. It was also around this time the UFC decided to book Pettis versus Gilbert Melendez to coach the Ultimate Fighter, which was okay, pretty cool, but it meant they didn't meet in the cage until December 2014, which was a whole year and a half since Showtime had won the title, the division was delayed again. Number 8. The Amanda Nunes Legacy Without a doubt, the lioness Amanda Nunes goes down as the greatest women's fighter of all time. She had two belts in different weight classes, defended them both, and most of the time, she was absolutely schooling her opponents. Oh, Nunes was... Oh! The only problem with that, and it's just a tiny one, is that when she did finally stop and decided to hang up her gloves and unstrap her belt, well, it kind of left two divisions in complete limbo, without a champion. And to make things worse, it's two divisions that had kind of suffered over the years for a number of reasons. Firstly, Amanda Nunes had that kind of Demetrius Johnson dominant champion effect. You know, with some of her fights, she just didn't face any adversity. And so she won, but they were kind of boring. All the contenders were being beaten, so when she left, well, there wasn't really anyone waiting in line to fight for the title, which is why at Bantamweight, it's taken eight months for the UFC to even put together a championship matchup for the new belt. And at Featherweight, well, I think Amanda may have wrecked that division so badly, and also because most of those girls fight at Bantamweight now anyway, that division may be stalled indefinitely. I do think making women's 125 also took away from Bantamweight and their potential championship contenders, but with Amanda Nunez's retirement, those two divisions pretty much completely shut down. They have to go, you know, the, the, the division have to move on. Number seven, GSP breaks everything. 
Without a doubt, Mike Bisping capitalized on a short notice title shot against Luke Rockhold and finally realized a career long dream and became a UFC champion. No one expected him to have the belt and now that he did, well the question was what do we do next? The UFC decided to ignore the rest of the rankings entirely and book Mike against Dan Henderson in a rematch several years in the making and a lot of the other fighters already felt hard done by this. I mean, Gegard Mousasi pretty much left the UFC because he just could not get a title shot. You know. I think if they would have come with the said, okay, you're fighting for the interim belt, things would have been more interesting to me. Mike's turnaround against Henderson was pretty quick, but that's when the real problem started. It wasn't until five months later that the champ's next opponent was announced, and it was going to be a returning GSP in a legacy-defining attempt to come back after several years and win another belt up a weight class. Michael Bisping, I've been training really hard, and I've been training really hard to come back and make a big, a big boom. And unfortunately, you'll be the victim of that. All very epic, but it did nothing but stall the division, really. Two months later, Dana announced the fight was cancelled. They couldn't agree on a date. GSP needed more time to put on the weight. So I alluded, possibly, that he was trying to get the steroids out of his system. But, I mean, the fight wouldn't take place until November, and the UFC even made an interim title fight between Bobby Knuckles and Yoel Romero. GSP and Bisping then fought for the actual belt over a year since it had last been contested. Yes! George won, but vacated the title 33 days later, so Rob was just promoted to the proper champion. But well, it didn't really end there either. Rob once again got injured when booked to defend his belt against Luke Rockhold. Luke Rockhold fought Yoel Romero for another interim title, but Yoel missed weight. Then Rob sat out again because of a nasty staff infection. It wasn't until a whole year after becoming the champion, Rob Whittaker finally got to defend his belt against Yoel Romero, but he missed weight, so it wasn't technically a defense. Rob won, but unfortunately it didn't end there. Four months later, Rob and Kelvin Gastelum were booked for the Ultimate Fighter, so again, the whole division was stalled while we all waited for that, and then Rob pulled out just hours before the fight because of a nasty hernia. So for the third time in as many years, they made another interim title fight between Israel Adesanya and Gastelum. Izzy won, and finally two years and 11 months after Bisping had beaten Henderson and the GSP negotiations began, order was finally restored when Adesanya and Whitaker fought in Australia, and the division went back to normal. Number six, Connor becomes boxing. It was a pretty crazy moment when Conor McGregor won two world titles, even if they stripped him of one just two weeks later, but he'd undisputedly made himself the most famous person in the sport. He was bigger than MMA, and well, he went after the biggest guy in boxing. Fuck the Mayweathers! He spent most of the next year campaigning for a fight against Floyd Mayweather. By June of 2017, the deal was done, and in August they fought, but yeah, the whole time, what the hell was going on with the lightweight division? Because uh, the champ certainly wasn't defending his belt. Conor was eventually stripped of that title, but it wasn't until months later. During that time, the UFC had desperately tried to book Tony versus Habib, but it ended up being Ferguson versus Kevin Lee for an interim title. That was ultimately taken away from Tony because he got injured, which led to Habib finally fighting for the lightweight title against Ally Quinta, and it finally been taken away from Connor, who held it for 511 days despite never even booking a title defense. After Habib won the vacant belt, though, not only was a matchup with Connor on the cards because of the rivalry and the money, but also it was only fair that he beat the former champion, considering Connor never technically lost that belt. Either way, Habib won that fight, but immediately threw everything into storm mode once again when he flew out the cage to attack Danis. And he's going right at Dylan Danis! Mayhem! Habib was suspended for this, for nine months, in fact. He ended up not fighting for almost a year, and in the meantime, Dustin Poirier finally touched UFC gold when he beat Max Holloway for an interim title in April. Habib would eventually fight Poirier in September, and he picked up a nice win. And for the final time, Tony and Habib were then scheduled in April of 2020, six months after the Poirier fight. But Namaga Madoff couldn't leave Russia because of the pandemic. Instead, Justin stepped up and won the third interim title up for grabs in the last three years at lightweight. It was five months after that, that Habib unified another UFC title when he beat Justin, and despite announcing his retirement that night, he wasn't officially stripped until March of 2021. So I know he was talking to Dana and everything, but that was just more time that went by where the lightweight division was just in complete limbo. Number five, Nganu chases his dreams. After Stipe had been declared the GOAT of the UFC's heavyweight division, Francis Ngannou came back for revenge in the rematch. He looked incredible against Stipe, won the title, and finally the heavyweight division was popping again. <laughs> What actually happened next is still affecting the division today. 
Francis is immediately unable to defend his title on a quick turnaround, so the UFC book an interim fight between Cyril Garn and Derek Lewis. Considering Ngannou was under contract negotiations with the UFC at the time, this put a ton of pressure on Francis, who didn't fight for the entire year. It wasn't until the start of January 2020 where he made his first defense against a new interim champ, Cyril Garn, and against all odds and injuries, he remained UFC champion. But then for another entire year, Francis held onto the title and didn't defend it. While he went back and forth with the UFC, negotiated about a fight with John Jones, and ultimately was released from his contract and stripped of his title in January 2023. So that was a whole nother year of absolutely nothing in the division. Just a couple of months later, John Jones would be crowned the heavyweight champion, but now it's already nearly been a whole year of that, where due to injuries, John has failed to defend the belt, and we have another interim champion in Tom Aspinall. And now it seems the division is going to be stalled for even longer as as John Jones is adamant he is fighting Stipe Miocic, and of course, in doing so, is holding up the division again. It's been two years and nine months since Francis knocked out Stipe, and although it felt like at times we'd found a bit of stability, the division has been pretty much fucked ever since. Number four, Conor McGregor abandons featherweight. Before that charming Irishman came along, featherweight wasn't exactly super exciting in the UFC. Conor completely changed that division to one of the most watched in the sport, and when he KO'd Aldo and took the belt, he was the biggest star in the promotion. Jose Aldo Jr. Conor relaxed and smiling. Oh, the new featherweight champion! But after that, things went completely off the rails in the division as Conor decided to do anything but defend the belt. He immediately wanted to challenge for a second title and become the first champ champ. The fight only fell apart with Rafael Dos Anjos and Nate Diaz stepped in on short notice to kickstart that whole rivalry. Now, was supposed to rematch at UFC 200. That fight fell apart as well because of McGregor skipping media obligations. But at that historic event, now six months after Conor won the belt, Jose Aldo fought Frankie Edgar for an interim featherweight title, which had seemed pretty pointless. Conor then showed no signs of wanting to return to 145 and unify the title against a man he'd just KO'd in 13 seconds and instead rematch Nate Diaz, then beat Eddie Alvarez to win a second belt at lightweight. And just 14 days later, he was stripped of the featherweight title and Jose Aldo was just promoted to undisputed champion again. Did we just like have a time skip? In a year, nothing had changed and Aldo was somehow the champion again. Anyway, the stalling didn't stop there. Aldo wasn't able to defend his new title and so the UFC decided to book Max Holloway against Anthony Pettis, I guess also to kind of put a title fight on a pay-per-view maybe. It also meant that promoting Aldo to undisputed champion had been pointless. Anyway, finally, a year after Connor had been stripped of the featherweight title, Max finally fought Aldo and was crowned the new champion. He would have to immediately rematch Aldo though just to make sure as Frankie Edgar pulled out of his fight with Max. If you ask me, nothing went back to normal until Max got to defend against the new contenders waiting in line when he fought Brian Ortega a whole three years after Connor had knocked out Aldo. Number three, Randy goes on vacation. As a lot of people's heroes, Randy Couture did some truly great things inside of the UFC. But as a guy who was also an advocate for fighters' rights, he had more than one falling out with the promotion. After he beat Tim Sylvia and won the heavyweight title for a third time in the last 10 years, everything seemed fine. But the division was about to go all over the place. Randy first defended his title a few months later against Gabriel Gonzaga, but just one month after that, he announced he was severing all ties with the UFC. I've had uh, issues with Zufa and the company since they bought it in uh, 2001. He was unhappy, but the UFC said, hey, you got two fights left on your contract. You're still the champion and you are not going anywhere. Right now, Randy Couture is the heavyweight champion of the UFC. He's under contract, he's the heavyweight champion, got fights left for that, so. They entered an ongoing lawsuit, and in the meantime, the UFC booked Big Nog to fight the former champ, Tim Sylvia, for an interim title while they figured out what to do. Eventually, the UFC and Randy came to terms and signed a new contract, the first fight being a massive pay-per-view event and a title defense against none other than Brock Lesnar. The Beast Incarnate beat the American hero. The midway point of round two. Heavyweight title oh, on the line. Randy but all that happened after that was just more chaos, really. What did they do with Big Nog? Well, just one month later, he fought Frank Mir for the interim title, while Brock waited and fought the winner, which just so happened to be Frank Mir, the man who handed Brock his first professional loss. It was supposed to take place at UFC 98, but it was delayed because of an injury, so the rivalry was settled at UFC 100. Brock came out victorious, but developed some serious health issues such as diverticulitis, and would be out for over a year as the division waited for its champion to return. There was no way they were stripping Brock, so another interim title fight happened between Shane Carwin and Frank Mir, and in July 2010, Brock finally defended his title for a second time against another interim champion. It kind of all started with Randy's contract dispute back in 2007, and the division didn't really get back to normal until Kane's arrival as champ almost three years later. Number two, light heavyweight devolves. 
Now, before we even start talking about 205, we have to remember all the chaos that went on when John was champion. The amount of suspensions, the times he was stripped, and the UFC actually did a pretty good job of keeping the division moving. But apart from when they did that whole Chael Son and John Jones thing. Somehow, after John left, though, things got even worse. John Jones beat Dominic Reyes, and then after a dispute about his contract in May 2020, John said he was vacating the light heavyweight title. He was looking for a fight with Francis Ngannou at heavyweight. Now, John wasn't officially stripped until August, but uh, what happened? happened to the rest of the division. Well, in September, the UFC tried to patch things up, and at first, it kind of went okay. Jan Blachowicz beat Dominic Reyes to win the vacant title, but immediately decided to not fight a ranked light heavyweight contender, and instead, the middleweight champion got a shot at the belt. It wasn't until October 2021, nearly two years after John had beaten Dominic Reyes, that Glover Teixeira bought Jan Blachowicz and won the title. He was booked to fight Yuri Prohaska, but that fight wouldn't happen for eight months as it was cooled off first of all, but eventually they fought in June and Yuri was crowned the new champion. So a rematch was booked for December, but Yuri suffered one of the worst shoulder injuries in the history of the sport. Glover Teixeira was offered Magomed Ankalaev on short notice, but Glover declined. So Yuri vacated the belt and Jan Blachowicz fought Ankalaev for the new vacant title, but it went to a draw, so that solved nothing. So just one month later, the UFC rebooked Glover against Jamal Hill for the vacant title. Hill won, but then unfortunately, six months later, had to drop the belt because he also got injured. Your perhaps Kyle was the champion. Um, he suffered an injury. He gave up the title to not hold the division up. To keep the division moving forward, I'll do the same. Yeah, I know, light heavyweight might be cursed. Honestly, it wasn't until Alex Pereira and Yuri Prohaska fought for the vacant title in November of 2023 that the division finally went back to normal and it kind of all started with John vacating the title over three years ago. Number one, control, alt, delete, lightweight. It took a while for the UFC to decide they were going to have weight classes. At first, you were called a lightweight if you were less than 200 pounds, which seemed kind of fair at the time. Eventually, we got heavyweight with Mark Coleman, then light heavyweight with Frank Shamrock, then welterweight with Pat Militich, before in 2001, the UFC decided to create a lightweight championship, and Jens Pulver battled in Atlantic City against the Shuto champion from Japan, Carl Uno, to strap up the first lightweight champion, Jens Pulver. Now, he defended the belt twice across the next year, and things seemed to be going well until March 2002, when the UFC and Jens didn't see eye to eye on his contract. He left for Japan and eventually for Pride, like a lot of fighters had started to do at the time, but what happened to the lightweight division without a champion? The UFC decided the best thing to do was to have a lightweight tournament to crown a new champion. Honestly, a great idea. Carl Udo beat D. Thomas, BJ beat Matt Serra, and the two men met in the final to crown a new champ. But unfortunately, that match also ended in a draw, something that really didn't happen very often back then, and it kind of left everyone wondering what the hell to do. Eventually, the UFC just close down the division entirely. So if you want to talk about being stalled, well, how about just removing it from the promotion? It wasn't until October 2006 when Sean Shirk beat the tough star Kenny Florian and was awarded the lightweight title. And it took him eight months to defend it before he immediately popped for steroids and the new tramp was stripped just one year after winning the belt. Not a great look, but one year later, BJ Penn won the vacant title beating Joe Daddy Stevenson about four and a half years after he went to that draw with Uno. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed today's video. It was a pretty fun one to work on, you know, albeit about stalling divisions. You can still have a good time learning about that. I want to give a shout out to George Hutchinson for editing this video. Thank you, George. Appreciate all your hard work on the channel, guys. Hope you liked it. He always makes them fun and informative. And here are his social medias where you can show him some support because he probably deserves it. I think he does. As always as well, before we go, shout out to our channel champions here at MMA On Point. They support the channel, you can too. There's a bunch of cool benefits to it as well. The link is in the description. Or you can click the button down below to join them. If you enjoyed the video as well though, guys, you can give us a like to show some appreciation or subscribe as well. We do a bunch of videos every week. I don't know if you had a division that you thought was maybe stalled more than others, or maybe a division we didn't talk about that you probably thought we should have done. You can leave us a comment down below. We like to read those and let us know your thoughts. All right, guys, thank you very much. I'll catch you in the next one. Hope you enjoyed this one. Until next time, go and watch some fights now, you maniacs.